you a little bit about my own personal experience with um, this. And I guess you could say their lack of sensitivity. <laughs> um, so basically, um, I was raised in the foster care system, and I didn't always have such negative experiences with the cops, actually, growing up recently. But they were my friends. <laughs> they were there to help me. Um, and in many ways, they were, until I got older. And um, when I became an adult, things changed dramatically, and I became seen as this threat, no longer with this cute, quirky, stylish kid. I mean, I still am, but they don't see me that way. <laughs> Um, now they see me as a threat of some kind. I don't know, I mean, all you need is five seconds to realize how awesome I am, but they didn't see it that way. So I had a couple of unfortunate events where the Seattle Police Department came in just, well, I shouldn't say guns and blazing, so I'm a little bit scared, but um, they just came in and they didn't really. Uh, take time to ask questions. They came in, assumed they knew the situation. First time it happened, I was um, at a shelter, and one of the other fellow shelter leaders, I guess you could say, was feeling threatened by me, and so they called the cops, and the cops showed up. I didn't even know the cops were allowed to come into this, this shelter, center area. They came in, they dragged me out, and um, roughed me up a little bit, then dragged me out, and Spend the night in jail because I was, what was the word they used? Being threatening or menacing to other people, I guess. Um, it was really sort of traumatizing because I'd never been arrested in my life for anything. And I guess telling someone to not disrespect you is considered a threat. So be it. Um, <laughs> second time I had an unfortunate incident place was with my ex birthday called and quote unquote said that I was basically a man and four male, heterosexual male police officers showed up at my door and they arrested me. They didn't even talk to anyone else in my apartment about what had happened and then they proceeded to search me as if I was a male. Um, I kept asking, uh, shouldn't a female officer be here to do this? Should a female officer be here to do this? And they kept telling me to be quiet. That's to say, because you know, once your handcuffs, you lose your ability to speak. Um, and then from then on, I was taken down to, I guess, the main place where they house people, where they go and find out I was a girl. <laughs> Surprise! And then they were like, oh, uh, we're going to have to research it again. <laughs> they had a female officer do the searching at that time. Uh, it was a little less awkward. But um, after that, it was more of just less and less cooperation. I was not able to go back to my residence. Um, all of my belongings were then thrown out. Um, I forget I'm a musician, so I was heartbroken because my keyboard, my drumsticks, all of those amazing things were gone. And it's like you can't put a price on your identity. You know, once that's like taken away and then closed all your personal things, it's like, it's hard. It's all because the cops could not escort me to get my things. So, that's to be all like, ah, oh, SP sucks, but they could do, I feel like they could just use some more sensitivity training, so maybe some more like awareness on like gender queer issues and on how to, to talk to, <laughs> to people. So, I don't want it to be like, oh, let's just get up here and bash this. Seattle Police Department, let's, you know, bring some positive ideas on how to help them do their job better. Because you know they're told every single day that they suck, this is true. But let's probably give them some pointers on, hey, you're not doing this as well as you should, so here's an idea on how you can do it better. That's just <coughs> That's my spiel. <laughs> All right. Pick up a copy in the back. 
Um, and her basic argument in this book is that mass incarceration today has become a new system of racial control following the demise of Jim Crow segregation in the South. And the brilliance of this new system is formally and officially its colorblind, and yet it does a remarkably efficient job of channeling greater and greater numbers of people of color um, and in Michelle's, uh, Michelle Alexander's words, creating a new permanent racial undercast in our society. And this is not some form of exaggerated rhetoric. Out of the approximately 2.3 million people behind bars, which makes the U.S. the largest jailer in the history of the planet by far, fully 60% are people of color, twice the proportion in society at large. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, one in three black men can expect to go to prison in their lifetime. One in three. There are currently more black men behind bars than there were slaves on plantations in 1850. And as Alexander notes, even once you're out of prison, and especially if you're branded with a felon label, it becomes perfectly legal to discriminate against you in all the same old ways. You're denied the right to vote, access to food stamps, housing, employment, public assistance. But as we've learned also, even if you've never set foot in jail or committed any crime, the public equation of black and brown with criminal means that you have a target on your back. We saw this, the world saw this with Trayvon Martin. In recent months, we saw this here in Seattle with John T. Williams. Um, and most recently, um, the shootings of Manuel Diaz and Joel Acevedo and Annie Nightingale. In fact, according to a report by the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, at least 120 black men and women were killed in the first few months of this year, either by police or self-styled vigilantes like George Zimmerman. That's one black person killed every 40 hours. And to put that statistic into context, 1892 was the year with the most reported lynchings of black people. There were 162 lynchings reported that year, or one every 54 hours. In other words, this year, more police murders of African Americans are taking place than lynchings at their height. And here in Seattle, we are no strangers to the new Jim Crow, right? People of color in Washington State represent 12% of the population, but 36% of its prisoners, meaning that we actually lead the pack in, in disproportionate incarceration of people of color. And due to felon voting laws, nearly one quarter of all black men in this state right now are disenfranchised. One quarter. And of course, we'll be talking more tonight about the racism and brutality of the Seattle Police Department, which has prompted a Department of Justice investigation and now a threat of lawsuit um, to try to force them to implement some reforms. Um, so thinking about dismantling this mass system of mass incarceration can seem really daunting, I think, but it's not impossible. We know this because ending slavery seemed impossible until it wasn't. Ending Jim Crow segregation seemed impossible until it wasn't. But it took the determined and courageous struggles over many years of those who came before us and from whose struggles we have so much to learn today. But I think we also have to ask ourselves a question, which is why do these new forms of racial control seem to always reemerge in different forms once we get rid of the old ones? And Alexander has a simple but I think compelling argument um, in the book based on looking at the history of how these institutions were put in place. And her argument is that they were consciously pushed and created by the ruling elites, the 1% we've been talking about, as a response to the threat of multiracial organizing from below. We can talk more about this. I just want to end with a quote um, from an interview she recently did in the International Socialist Review. What I hope is we can find a way to begin a serious dialogue about the ways in which race has been used to pit poor whites and poor folks of color against each other repeatedly throughout history to the disadvantage of all people, of all colors. And that this conversation be pursued not just in leftist circles, but that we begin to have this conversa conversation within communities. Communities who I think have provided a history, the evidence, and the data can be more open to thinking critically about how and why poor folks have managed to stay lost in a bitter war, a virtual hunger games, battling things out amongst themselves rather than challenging more of those who are designing the rules of the game. So 
I'm very excited to begin this discussion here in Seattle today. Um, and I have, we have a fantastic panel of speakers. Um, so what I'm going to do is just introduce all of them at once in the order that they'll be speaking. And they'll each come up for about five minutes and we'll have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Um, and just to say, uh, we're in the discussion, we really want to prioritize anybody who's had first-hand experience with the criminal justice system. So if you're willing to share or want to share with us, please think about sharing your words. We'd love to hear them and we'll prioritize them. Um, so our lineup of panelists. Uh, first up, we'll have Elaine Simmons, um, who is the executive director and co-founder of Peace for the Streets by Kids for the Streets. Um, she will be followed by two uh, two participants from Peace for the Streets by Kids in the Streets, uh, Jack and Ellen um, and Cody. They will be followed by Tim Harris, who is the executive director uh, and founder of Real Change Newspaper. Um, Dee Dee, who is a prison abolitionist activist, will be speaking afterwards. Uh, Jesse Ugovian, Seattle High School teacher, founder of Social Equality Educators and the International Socialist Organization. And last but not least, James Bible of the Seattle King County and the LACP. So join me in welcome more. Oh, okay. yes. Should not be combined in order to ensure kids' safety. 
runaway children should not be locked up. Yeah. The civility laws are a city-based legal <coughs> entity that has been put in place to try and solve the homeless growing population in Seattle. These laws are a form of profile profiling and that is targeting and directed towards a specific population, the homeless. <coughs> These laws that were created were to make Seattle a more livable city so that tourists did not have to see the homeless community. These laws don't change anyone's behavior. Scenario two. So, I'm representing um, a early 20s gay homeless male. I was hanging out in neighbor's alley and had to urinate, and neighbors would not let me use their bathroom. As I was peeing behind a dumpster, a police bike officer rolled up on me and cited me for urinating, urinating in public, which gave me a sex offender's fee for public exposure. This is ludicrous and has created a stigma in my life forever. A solution is to have more public access bathrooms and not arrest them for a basic need. These laws be that are extreme and restricting too much individual freedom to preserve order. To make the community a better place for all of its inhabitants, we need to abolish laws that criminalize folks for basic needs and survival. There needs to be alternatives to the prison industrial complexes and a more community-driven approach to community accountability for status offenses such as running away, being held in contempt of court because you got a sit-down, laid off violation, and failed to show up for a hearing, having your home raided and failed in a squat and all your personal belongings, belongings being thrown away. The mortality rate among homeless and at-risk youth and young adults is staggering. Scenario three. I'm representing an African-American 26-year-old homeless male while I was homeless on Capitol Hill, I was in QFC and boosted a space bag, and a police officer stopped me as I was leaving the store. They accidentally raised a hand with a wine bottle, which resulted in knocking the glasses out the cop. I was arrested for assault on an officer. Years later, I'm doing well, cleaning off the streets, but anytime I walk on Broadway, I'm continually contacted by the police. My name is Ron, and I'm treated unfairly. Each time, I come up with no warrants. The most difficult obstacle for many of the young people are the encounters with the criminal justice system. A high percentage of the people I work with have had unfriendly contact with the police and have done jail and prison time. The recidivist rate is overwhelming. Let's not dismiss how many of the so-called homeless criminals are actually victims of crimes against them, and they choose not to report them because fearful of being re-victimized by a system that has run, will run their name if they come into contact with them. One program PSKS has put in place is a friendly surrender. Scenario one. Um, so, Excuse me. Could you go to the mic, sir? No one behind you. No one can hear behind you. Don't be able to mic. I'm a 17 year old runaway female. I was assaulted at Westlake by a rival gang of girls. I was taken to Harborview with the concussion. This outreach lady, Wayne, rode with me in the ambulance. While in the examining, in the examining room, the nurse pulled Elaine aside and told her that there, was, there is a run report, and they called the social worker who was coming to get me and lock me up in juvenile hall. Elaine came back in and told me that there was a bus stop across the street. And then she smiled. Five minutes later, I came running across the street and she took me home for a few days of rest at the risk of harboring a To wrap up, I basically am trying to say that more communities are turning to transformative justice and community accountability and broadening their ideas around alternative approaches to locking up children and young adults. We are having dialogues like today on what this would look like. If in the case of locking up a runaway, there's got to be something so horrible happening in the home for them to run away. And the court solution to this is lock up a child for five days to investigate what is going on in the home. This is unacceptable and inhumane. Thank you. My name is Jacqueline Mellon. I became homeless at the age of 12. Being a runaway homeless drug addict, my encounters with police were mostly negative. Uh, the reason I was even reported a runaway at all was because my parents were going to be charged $20 every day that I could go to school in the Spokane school district. Otherwise, they did not care if I was home or not. I was arrested multiple times for being a runaway, and every time I was taken to runaway centers, they always tried sending me home, having no idea they were attempting to put me back into an abused, broken home that didn't want me. One time I 
time I was picked up by a cop for being a runaway, but the day before, that same cop had taken me to the CRC where my parents had removed the run report. So the cop saw that the run report was indeed gone, but he pulled over right on the university way and said, you see that guy right there? Well, he has a warrant. Now I'm going to let you out of the car and I'm going to arrest him. And because of this purposeful and careless action, I was later that day stabbed by the girlfriend of the arrested man for being a cinch, even though I did not know either of them. However, my perception of police would take a complete 180. I got involved with a homeless advocacy center called Peace for the Streets by Kids from the Streets. Youth would constantly come in talking about the negative encounters with police. Upon seeing this, we asked youth what they wanted to do about it. They suggested having some kind of dialogue with the police. So with PSKS and the Seattle Police Department, we launched our first Donut Dialogue, which was a luncheon between cops and homeless kids. We had three set questions like, why did you become a cop? Why did you become homeless? And, finally, and I finally got a chance to tell the police that I was out there because my parents hurt me and I had nowhere else to go. In return, one cop told us that he saw his whole family murdered right in front of him. And instead of becoming homeless, he went into the police force. It was a humbling experience for both the youth and the police involved. From then on, I realized that most police are just as human as you or me. Another cop told me that, yes, she is hard on street kids, but that's because she had to hold a 16-year-old girl as she died in her arms from an overdose after all her friends left her there to die. And she doesn't ever want to experience that again. And my encounters with police improved from then on, even though I was still homeless after the dialogues. Then when I was 20, I found out I was pregnant, and shortly after, I was arrested for possession of heroin. The police were more than fair with me. They only charged me with possession, even though they could have charged me with much more. The officer told me that he knew I was pregnant, and he thought some time in jail might do me some good. And he was absolutely right. I got connected to methadone and resources like Moms Plus and Drug Court and treatment. If I had not gone into treatment and then had Drug Court afterwards to keep me in line, I probably would have lost my daughter, and I'd probably be dead by now. I can hardly say, I can honestly say that cops saved my, <coughs> my daughter's life. The system does work in some situations, and I'm an example of that. However, prisons don't rehabilitate people. I think a better use of money is to work on prevention. It is a well-known fact that prevention is cheaper for the community. Instead of incarcerating people, we should be educating them on the laws and put money into more programs like Donut Dialogues and Drug Court. Also having housing programs for high utilizers of jails, especially if they're being repeatedly arrested for crimes having to do with homelessness, like the ones Elaine mentioned earlier. Let's work on prevention and not prison. Hello. Hello. I'm Cody Andrew. I am a 24-year-old male from Vermont. I'm homeless. I've been homeless since I was 16 years old. I've been riding freight trains all over the country all my life. Recently, I got arrested for 44 days for participating in the May Day protests. I smashed up the windows of a federal courthouse in response to my anger and how angry I am with this government and the way they treat people. And the, going to federal prison only taught me more. Only serving 44 days, that was nothing. I've served jail time all my life. I've encountered so many police officers in my life. I've been arrested, had my name run, been strip searched, been everything, through every situation I could possibly imagine, whether I did anything illegal or not. The point is, is these people are out there ruining lives, especially the federal government. They do not care about the people they are arresting. They do not care how much time they get. They do not care if they're good people. All they care about is, did you commit the crime, and can you connect me to the bigger person? They, they can arrest you on a crime called conspiracy. I don't know if you've ever heard of conspiracy, but say that you think about selling a lot of drugs. Well, that's illegal, and the government can arrest you for that because you had the thought to. They're beginning to arrest people for their thoughts, for what they think, for what they do, for everything around them. These people that are in power don't have your best interests in mind, never will have your best interests in mind. And my opinion, the matter of fact is, is that I don't want to work with them. I don't want to try to make a new world with them. I don't want to try to restructure the system so that they'll treat us fairly. I say instead we take them down. Straight up. Don't try this time trying to work with them. They don't want to work with you. They care about their money. That's all they care about. And that's all they see when they look at you. And the only reason they care when we get angry and when people protest is because, oh no, the money's complaining. They need to go back and spend money. They're spending hours and they could be spending money. They don't care. They're not going to care. And the police don't care either. The minute you become a police officer, the minute you sign on to that job, you know who you're protecting. 
You can't tell me cops don't. You can't tell me. I don't care if it's the nicest cop on the planet. The interests they have are not in the interests of their people. So why should we listen to them? Why should we care what they have to say? Why not just walk away? Why are we scared of them? All they want to do is intimidate us. That's all they've done ever is intimidate us. That's why they show them in their big boots and their big badges and their suits. It's intimidation. Don't forget the gun. And the gun. It's to intimidate you. It's to make you feel lesser than them. Why should we ever listen to anyone who tries to make us feel lesser? Ever. Ever. At all. At any point. Anything. For anything at all. No matter what the issue. We should just destroy these people and destroy the corporations that support them. Because they're, we're, nothing's going to change. I promise you, nothing's going to change. I would love it to change. I would love it if we could all just sit down, get along, and say, hey, these are our problems, this is the problems we have, then party B be like, oh, well, that's the problems you have, well, this is how we can work with you, and this is how we can make a better world. But we can't until we get rid of the powers that'll be, because they will not work with us. They will not. And when we try to work with us, it doesn't work, because the mass of public is so sedated by technology, it's so sedated by things I can't even imagine. We're bought and traded like cattle, and we're okay with it. We volunteer for all of this. We volunteer to be put in jail. We volunteer to have our rights taken away. We volunteer for all of this. We let them do it. We say, hey, if you have the power, we're going to give it to you. Do what you want with it. And then we sit back idly, and we bitch, and we moan, and complain, and say, they're not treating us fairly. We shouldn't waste time with that. We should be more proactive. We should be in their face and saying, either treat us fairly, or we're not going to take it anymore. They're scared of us. That's why they oppress us. That's the number one reason that they oppress us. They are terrified because we are the consumer. If we stop spending money, their system falls apart. Everything falls apart. Those big red bank, big rich bankers, the cops, everything, done, over with. It's just they have no power, and once they have no power, they will run away scared because behind all that tough, macho, whatever they have, they're cowards. In the very heart of their soul, they're cowards. They're scared of us, so we have all the power. Don't think you're powerless. Don't think one person is powerless. Never think that, ever at all. One individual has all the power, and we are a mass of individuals. So get us all together, and we can all work together because we all know something wrong. We all have different perspectives and different things we'd like to change. But I don't think we all have a common consensus of what is right and what is wrong and what is going to be the perfect system. But we know this system is wrong. And I can't promise you the next system, if we do change the system, is going to be better or, or the, the magical utopian society where everyone gets whatever they want and everyone lives and it's cake and cookies for everyone. And, but what I can promise you is that if we take this out, we can try. And that's the best we can do, is try. Because I want to try so badly. I want to try. I don't want to sit there and just talk at these people and be like, well, you should stop that. <laughs>
I don't. I didn't. Um, you know, it is, I think it's the book of the last several decades right. and the issue of, of our time. And it connects really seamlessly to the issue of homelessness. I mean, you take mass incarceration, you take mass homelessness, you put them together, you know, I mean, up until the 70s, we only had about 300,000 people in the United States in jail. That was too many at the time. But now, you know, it's one in 99 people that are in the prison system, one in 36 that are under the supervision of, of the, the, the law enforcement, the law enforcement system. Um, world's, world's biggest jailer. And it has become the common sense of our time in a way that is sort of invisible, in a way that is entirely too acceptable. One of the things that I run up against all the time in the work I do, we are running this campaign right now called Occupy CDHKC. <coughs> and, you know, it targets the decision makers around homelessness, uh, the Committee to End Homelessness in King County. And it basically calls them out for not really being a plan to end homelessness at all. That, you know, being uh, participating in, in an ideology to make homelessness acceptable, to morally neutralize homelessness as an issue, to bring it down to being about screwed up individuals and how we can fix them as opposed to a screwed up system and how we can overthrow that. And two minutes left. Okay, I got a hurry thing up there. So I'm going to talk about the jail campaign. When we started the jail campaign to get them to not build a new municipal jail, it was accepted. It was inevitable that they were going to build this jail. They had their numbers. They said, "Look, the numbers are going up. We have no choice." but to build this jail. Nobody wants to, but we have this debate about it. It's really only about war. You all just go to sleep and let us do it. And we allied with groups like the NAACP and the Defenders Association and the ACLU, class, incarceration, and our social priorities. And somehow, miraculously, we actually managed to win. We turned this thing around. From the start of it, we couldn't even get our closest ally, Nick Licata, to like book the Bertha Landis room for us for a rally because he didn't want to offend his other city council members. To at the end of the thing, at the end of the thing, it was like the political common sense. You know, we had flipped the political common sense of the thing so that the only people who were running for office that stood up and said that the new jail was a good idea was Tom Carr and Greg Nichols, and we saw what happened to that. <laughs> and there were several things that, you know, I take away from that campaign. One is that you don't need everybody with you. You know, we went to lots of groups and tried to get them in that campaign. It was sort of our noble little band of dissidents that turned this thing around. I mean, the urban league basically laughed us out of the room when we went to them. You know, you don't need power to be on your side. You're not going to have the big institutions on your side. You don't need them. You know, it's a relatively small group of people can make big change. Another thing is, you know, talking about politics during the election season is the best time to talk about politics because people are staking out positions and you can hold folks accountable. You know, and Constantine, McGinn, Holmes, they all staked out anti-jail positions during their campaigns. And when they got elected, they needed to follow through on that. Um, and the other thing is that priorities. People understand talking about priorities, and they will try to dissuade you from that. One of the happy accidents that we had, wasn't really such a happy accident, but it was a rhetorical coup anyway, was that the school system started closing schools in, in, in African-American neighborhoods as we were running the jail campaign. 
And that was a no-brainer connection for us to make. What? They can spend $180 million on building a new jail that can close the schools in African-American neighborhoods, and everybody knows that there's a sort of a pipeline from you know communities of color and college, or high school dropouts into the jail system. And they came back with the most inevitable response that, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, we knew this was what they were going to say. It's what they said. That pot of money has nothing to do with this pot of money. You are all woefully misinformed. If only, if only you understood what was really going on, you would know how ridiculous that argument is. But, you know, everybody knew that we were right. And I think, you know, to wrap up, everybody understands that mass homelessness, you know, that the fact that when you walk down the street, you have to step over people. Everybody knows that that is wrong. Everybody knows that that is a moral travesty. But yet, at the same time, when we say, we'll never solve homelessness as a social services problem, we have to create economic justice. People look at us and they say, whoa, economic justice, how are you gonna do that, you know? And it's the same thing with mass incarceration. People look at it as being this big problem that is so entrenched, so institutionalized, you can't change it. And I think our answer to that has to be, you know what, it's just wrong. And we've got no choice. We don't care whether it's politically possible. It has to change, and we're not going to be satisfied until we do it. Right. Came here under a refugee status, economic refugees and disabilities. Um, because of that, we're well, in the process of coming in the early 90s, um, experience similar to what I would be talking about relate to police brutality or police, or police harassment is that's where it began for me. The strip search, being an immigrant coming to this country, the economic refugee, started in my own country. Coming here only escalated that problem. As an economic refugee, a rights, and then you know, so from here, I will talk about why I am abolitionist. Two thousand two, I was just fresh out of high school, trying to be a nurse, volunteering at um, Harvard. I was running late. I was running down. <coughs> In the middle of the day, one o'clock, running, trying to catch the bus, I run the red light. Well, I'm running, walking, and trying to catch this uh, yellow light, and I get stopped by a police officer. Matter of fact, I was the only one running. It was me and another white girl. I get stopped. I get citation for jaywalking. I point out, hey, why am I the only one getting citation? She just walked with me. Not to, you know, expose what she did, but this is about justice, right? We both did something wrong. <coughs> I got a citation in 2002 for jaywalking. <coughs> Mind you, right after the early, right after I came here as a refugee, I got placed in foster care. Being placed in foster care, Emotional, physical, language barriers, homeless, abuse, all these other things are factored in my life at this point. And right not too long after that, 2001, Aaron Roberts, that put on the in Union. That's when I first began, it's like, wow, well, this, this is messed up. This is messed up. Not even a block away, a black <coughs> woman gets stopped, harassed, pulled over and shot to death. That's where I started. This is not right. <coughs> long after, too long, not long after that, 2000, 
two and three. I'm coming out of the foster care system. I'm 18. No kind of walk through process of my young adult life. What it would be. How to navigate that process. I get caught up. I moved to West Seattle for the city. During the early of 2000, gentrification. During that process, I came to know an officer, Steve Cox. Because of when he used to be, just to kind of see the process, he used to be a prosecutor. From a prosecutor, he became, he became a police officer. During that process, I learned 13 of us got part this operation called We Didn't See Operation. We didn't see the operation. And that's what I call my felony. I fought for years and years because of my immigration status and still fighting. A double jeopardy. Long to that, many experiences believe me, this system not not work. Not just in the US, but around the world. What caused me to be here was that they came on the genocide. What caused me to be here is a global imperialist system. What caused me to this day to face what I'm facing is not because of personal, but it is a capitalism. It's because of economic status. It's, it's systemic oppression on all people. Because of this, in my experiences, Trying to rehabilitate in this process, coming out, trying to raise my family. I learned more in depth and rooted problem. It's not about individual. It's a systemic issue because of, because of the iron and abolitions. Because of that, you can't talk about prisons. I'm talking about immigration, closing borders. You can't talk about that without talking about education. You can't talk about that without talking about housing. You can't talk about that without talking about health care. And so on and so on. Because our oppressions are interconnected. That's right. Interconnected. That's why we have to stand up and be abolitionists. That's why we have to stand up and say no more. We can't just rely on reforms. We can't rely on reform. I believe in tactics, but we can't stop there. Because reform, what passed and what law one legislation undo by ten legislations. Undo it by ten legislations. Because of that, through my experience in, in working with uh, black prisoners' contacts, which is a member of prison, brightest, intelligent, rehabilitated man, working in the community, yet so far, I mean, I could go on, but the problem is still here. The six C's. They made a major change. We'll still be here. Because without challenging capitalism, we can't challenge incarceration. that first year had a father 
or uncle in prison or uh, dead. And I, there was one student in that class that I thought was going to make it out. Because this kid, early, he just had a cool about him. Nobody messed with this kid, and they messed with everybody. You're always trying, it was just such a tough environment. But there's something about this kid that was, um, everyone knew he was going somewhere, and he was quiet and collected and got his work done. And for some reason, the kids always left. If someone went to mess with him, all the kids would get together. That's early, leave him alone. And I never really understood exactly how that worked out, but for some reason this kid was always on point getting his work done and everyone left him alone. And I was sure that if anyone was going to make it out, it would be him. And I was reminded uh, of this student recently and I went and Googled him trying to find what happened. And I'm, I'm in school on my lunch break. And up comes this disgusting website called Busted that takes people's mug shots and writes Busted across the, the faces of these human beings. And there it is, uh, having two different charges, and now, now this kid is in, in jail. And I don't know what he did or why he ended up there. I don't know the specifics of this case, but I do know that we have a school to prison pipeline in this country that systematically funnels brilliant young children like this uh, instead of into their hopes and dreams it funnels them behind cages and i want to I map out for you the school to prison pi pipeline briefly before i talk about my best day and some of the solutions the school to prison pipeline begins with a curriculum in these textbooks that completely leaves out African Americans and struggles of people of color and working class people. <laughs> it will mention Martin Luther King, right, but it won't mention the thousands of people who fought beside him uh, and the mass movements that were created. Um, my textbook in my world history class, when we have this section on, on world slavery, completely leaves out Toussaint Louverture, who led the Haitian slave revolt. The only time that slaves freed themselves in world history, there is no discussion of that in the textbook. That's where the school to prison pipeline begins, and then it takes a turn, and it continues when. Uh, you have states like Washington use fourth grade reading scores to determine how much prison cells to build, right? Instead of investing in reading programs, we invest in metal bars. The school to prison pipeline continues with zero tolerance policies in our schools. The Michelle Alexander recently in a Rethinking Schools article very brilliantly laid out, and she said actually the Get Tough movement that developed in the war on drugs, the manual that the DEA uses actually was cut and pasted into many of the school districts uh, manuals for how to deal with, with uh, discipline problems. And then the school to prison pipeline continues with the suspension rates, 3.5 times higher for black kids doing the exact same offenses than white kids nationally. And 40% of all black students or of all students expelled from school are black, right? That's the school to prison pipeline in, in our nation. It's absolutely uh, uh, despicable. And the, the Department of Justice recently came to Seattle and did an audit of the Seattle Police Department that found horrible abuses. One in five arrests in Seattle, according to the federal government, is a violation of your constitutional rights, and that most that there's an extraordinary use of abuse uh, in these arrests, and that they're primarily focused on communities of color. Our police department was outed and exposed for the many things we have seen in our communities, from John T. Williams, a homeless man shot down dead, to a black woman caught on a uh, 16 year old black girl caught on cell phone being punched in the face for jaywalking. We've seen uh, the abuses that the Department of Justice laid out and showed uh, systematically occur in, in our city. And as bad as that and as damning as that report was of the, the Department of Justice, 
It says nothing about the new Jim Crow. It really doesn't talk about the school to prison pipeline. It doesn't talk about the institutions that are set up to funnel my kid early into, into school. So as damning as that report is, that report is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, the racial injustice and the mass incarceration that we're facing in this city. And so if, if the response to that report is the mayor of Seattle finally relenting, at first saying, I'm not going to have anything to do with the federal report, this report is useless and untrue, and I won't do anything, to realizing that he was going to be sued by the federal government for not reforming the police department, they've now recently, just this week, come to an agreement, the city and the Department of Justice, and they say, we have this magical plan, right, to end these police abuses, and this magical plan hinges around having a community commission where there will be people that can advise the police. Well, we already had one, and it hadn't worked then. This new commission doesn't have any power to change anything. It's just recommendations. And frankly, we are sick and tired of these abuse after abuse after abuse. And we want some real change in this city, in a city that's been shown over and over again to systematically incarcerate and abuse uh, our young people and our people of color. We want some real change. And I just want to end with that. First of all, the chief of police, Chief Diaz, has to go. That's a fair thing. He needs to be thrown out, terminated, the, the, the Department of Justice report said the problem goes all the way to the top. We didn't need that report to know it, but now it is absolutely evident, and I hope that every one of you will sign the petition that says we call on Chief Diaz to step down because I think if we went to the mayor's office with tens of thousands of signatures from community people all over Seattle, that would be a powerful message that they couldn't ignore and that that would be the beginning of our movement for Chief Diaz to fall. But that would be the very beginning of something that I think we would need complete, uh, uh, complete changes. And I think the, the best day of my teaching career I'm going to end on, which also happened this year, and there's some students here that were part of that, um, which was I went down to do the police work that should be done in this uh, city, which was going to Olympia to issue a citizen's arrest warrant of our state legislature for failing to fully fund our schools. It says in our state constitution, it's the paramount duty of Washington State to fully fund education. Judge Ehrlich at that point had ruled that our state legislature was out of compliance with the school funding law, so the social equality educators group that I'm part of did the work that the police should be doing and went down to arrest the legislature. In the course of that action, I was arrested. The police officer didn't agree with my interpretation of the law. And my students formed a Facebook page when I came back the next day to school, it, it was free Mr. Hagopian. <laughs> 200 students had signed on to that, but they took it to the next step, which was let's walk out against the budget cuts now that we freed Mr. Hagopian. Um, and so 500 students walked out of Garfield High School, and they didn't just walk out of Garfield High School. with signs fund our future they created a pamphlet that went through what the budget cuts to our schools have done in terms of no more summer school programs so the kids who are most at risk who fall behind in credits then are uh, more at risk of not graduating without the summer programs no more four years uh, of language at, at our school we're seeing overcrowding schools last year every single one of the elementary school counselors was laid off in Seattle Right? They went through and showed what these budget cuts are doing. They took their message to the mayor. They demanded an audience with them. 500 students chanting outside of City Hall. He had to come down and agree that they were right. Um, and their picture was in the New York Times. And they formed a citywide organization to have a mass citywide walkout against the budget cuts. And I'm here to tell you today, this is the first year 
that the state legislature has not cut the K-12 budget. And I think our students have to do This is the first year since the recession that that's happened, and that shows the power of people. And I think if you were to join the No New Jim Crow Coalition here in Seattle and build for a mass march in the fall, we could have that same impact and making the chief of police fall as a beginning, and then I think we could set a whole new horizon for what's possible in this city for providing opportunities for our youth instead of jailing them like animals. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is James Bob, I'm president of Seattle King County Branch of the NAACP. Legal redress for the states of Alaska, Oregon, Washington for the NAACP. I run my own law office. As I enter into my 40th year of life, I can look at my other African American male friends and know that at some point in time, each and every one of us has been placed up against a wall by a police officer, patted down and humiliated in the most horrific sorts of ways. It did not matter whether we are lawyers, it didn't matter if we were doctors, secretaries, maintenance men, had trouble with the law before, or had never been in trouble before. It didn't matter. Our commonality was our skin. Our commonality was our gender. And that's part of the black male experience. Not only in Seattle, but across our nation. I remember the first moment when I was first approached by officers and put up against the wall. I was 13 years old, walking with three other African-American male friends. All of us had attended school. None of us were in trouble at all. None of us had been in trouble at all. We'd just gone to this place called Arnold's, which was a video game place in the university district. Out of nowhere, as we were starting to walk home to the bus, officers approached us and put us up against the wall. They said, where were you running? He said, we weren't running at all, sir. Where were you going? Where did you come from? What were you doing? And then finally they told us what we had done. They told us that we had jaywalked. Now the irretrievable truth is that none of us had in fact jaywalked. The truth is that we had waited at every street corner, waited for the light, passed correctly, but none of that mattered, and it certainly was not the place to argue. As the next officer came with his canine dog, we were all given tickets, but this did not end the humiliation. Two weeks later, I received a notice in the mail saying that I had to go to this class for serious offenders. As I went to Seattle Central Community College and sat in the back row, each kid that was there, almost all of us African-American males, had to stand up and say what they did to get there. I guess that's part of accountability. So people said and stood up and said that they've been part of, of just getting out of juvenile prison for drive-by shootings and assisting and such. Uh, have been getaway drivers and burglaries and the like, all traffic sort of issues. The sad thing, or the interesting thing, is that I seem to be the only one there for jaywalk. How am I going to handle this? How am I going to handle this? And I must admit to you, what I did was I stood up and I said, I have to be honest with you, teacher. I'm going to do this again. Every kid turned and looked at me like I was the hardest one in the room. <laughs> I told him, you know what? I'm you might call habitual. <laughs> it got worse because everybody was like, oh my goodness. He's not even trying to pretend that he's going to do better. And then finally I said, that's right, I jaywalked and I'll do it as soon as I leave this room. <laughs> now y'all, the, the teacher said, you have to take responsibility for what you do. I can't believe you walked into my classroom and this is how you respond. And then he looked down at his register and he said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't know how you got here, but you're here and you have to go through my class. 
Now fast forward, we've got too many incidents like that to talk, talk about. Fast forward, I'm not very good at paying attention. <laughs> fast forward, 10 years later, high school football star, college football star, started graduate school, decided to apply and work as a counselor in a juvenile correctional facility. There was just one problem. Criminal history showed up. Criminal history on somebody that had never been in trouble before, that had never been charged with a crime. Criminal history showed up. Where did that come from? You might not get your first job out of college. Yeah, something strange came up. Everybody started to look at me weird. I asked them to check again and again. And finally they did and they discovered that. They discovered that it was a jaywalking infraction rather than a criminal infraction. They discovered that what's called a, a JIS number, which is a juvenile number that's supposed to be put on somebody for a criminal conviction, was actually put on me and still active even though I was 25 years old. So when you talk about gang bills, when you talk about forcing people to stay in their place, when you talk about whether or not somebody can achieve to the highest degree, whether or not they've done anything wrong, under, understand the institutional impediments that are put in place to make sure that children of color, African American boys, do not have the same opportunity to achieve and stand against that. And stand against that. But don't stop there. Don't stop there. Because if at any point in time I had decided to punch an officer in the mouth or whatever, I wouldn't be here today in the room with the Department of Justice and the Seattle Police Department letting them know that their agreement is the floor, not the ceiling. Letting them know that it will be up to the people of Seattle to do something better. Letting them know that the people of Seattle expect the police in Seattle to enter an agreement with us where they will stop beating poor people and they will stop beating children. And the goal is to support human rights and the human condition and civil rights. It's not on any one single individual. Be this year, fun run, 25th, every single person be there. It'll be at Judgment's Park. We have booze link to uh, free confidential HIV testing, high blood pressure information and the like, nonviolence information. And on the other side, we're going to have information about why charter schools are wrong. <laughs> Uh, services if needed in school. We need to decide that we will create our own positive institutions. That's the truth. You don't have choice of power. That's way through that. Now there is a walk and a run. It's free for everybody to go to the park. Now if you're going to participate in the run, we're asking for $30 for adults, $15 for children, and none of that money will go to the NAACP. All of that money will go to three impoverished schools in the city of Seattle, in the Central District of South End. All of that money is an absolute idea that college and opportunity, all of our children can achieve to the highest degree. And what I'm going to say to this group is at no point should we ever be teaching our children that they can exceed and succeed at the highest level, because they can. And there will be obstacles, and it's up to us to stand in the way and say it's wrong, it's going to change. But let's help our kids grow.